Hey guys, welcome back. This is Chris Bircher. This is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom, episode 125. Man, when you add in all the uh, interviews I did, I'm well over 150 episodes and in my third year, I think, on Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. I appreciate uh, those of you who are listening. And if, please, you know, if you like this stuff, the only way anybody else is ever going to find it is if you tell them about it. And, you know, I guess that's good for everybody. So if you feel like doing that, that'd be great. Uh, this episode is, I'm going to call Codependency and Other Addictions. Kind of building off of episode 124, which is about leaders, and all leaders are narcissists. So, does that mean that everybody else is codependent? You know, there's this classic codependent, narcissistic, narcissist relationship thing. And um, at least it's classic if you've ever experienced either of those things, you know what I'm talking about. If not, we'll go into it a little bit. Uh, and then, mostly what I want to talk about is personal responsibility. As a as sort of a next step after self awareness, you know, once you're self aware, once you realize you're the person listening to the voice in your head, and once you build a meditation practice or journaling or whatever it is that you build into your life, where you where you, where you buy yourself these moments where you can actually decide what you're going to do uh, when, once you jump off the, the the rat race train and sort of look at yourself and go, what you know, I'm aware now. What like like that classic final scene from the original Finding Nemo, you know, where the fish get in the bags and they hop across the street and they're free and they land up in the ocean, but they're in this big plastic bag and, you know, bloat the big puffer fish is like, now what? <laughs> you finally get this thing. And so I think the first step after you're aware and after you learn that you can control your life is you have to be responsible for yourself. Um and that kind of where I want to end and where I'll go with this is this whole idea that it takes a village. And I believe that. And we are connected and we need to help each other out and be conscious of that. But at the same time, you've got to show up uh, with a certain degree of what well, I'll call personal responsibility. You don't you, you just go to the village and uh, you know suckle at the teats of <laughs> everyone else. You have to show up. And so that's what this is about. And, and I think, I think all, many of us in this, in, in as much as this narcissistic leader, codependent follower thing exists in the world, uh, you know, it's an, it's an addiction because, well, I'll get to that. So I think in this world, at least, and I, and I can't help but look at sort of the Trump era but really any of American politics in my lifetime for the last 50 years, where we sort of like, we think we vote and we pick leaders, I guess in any democracy, and that absolves us of all of our responsibility. It's like we have this one job, and once we do that, everything else will just fall into place and our lives will be blissful. And it just doesn't work like that. And I think, and then the second, the second thing I think of is sort of like the Charles Manson, the cults. And I just read about this in the paper. Apparently, there was some religious cult in Kenya where 300 people were missing and 200 bodies were found uh, because he talked. This guru, leader, narcissistic leader, talked these codependent followers into starving themselves. You know, as a as a as a uh, uh, showing their love for Jesus or something like that. It's just insane. And so you have a lot of these times where there's leader and followers. Even in a classic sort of Christian marriage in, in, in the United States, you know, the husband, the father is seen as the leader and everybody else in the house are their followers. And, and, and I get it. That sort of works. You don't, you don't charge into war with an army without a strong general making all the decisions and telling people what to do. It just works. It's easier. It's streamlined. But... I don't think that that existed for m- most of human evolution. I think it was more of this democratic village. And I don't even know what it looked like. You know, we can guesstimate, speculate, it doesn't matter. But I think we've reached this point where some people are willing to take all the responsibility and all the glory and, and all the blame, and other people don't want any of that, and it's, and it's fear-based. And so you end up with a classic codependent, narcissistic relationship at all different levels in human society uh, along some continuum of full-blown independent narcissists and full-blown dependent codependents. And what I know about codependency is from my first marriage where 
you know, and things I learned from my family of origin where my mom and dad were sort of this classic narcissist independent and, and really my dad's existence depended on my mom, what I would always say, eating the shit sandwiches and doing whatever he needed to prop him up so that he could experience all the benefits of that. And and if you look back in time, the sort of classic 50s dads and, and all these relationships, I see these family units in America and stories like Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. You know, there are all these classic men doing basically, you know, working, but then justifying working with being able to do whatever they wanted to. And then in order for that to exist, for him to eat lunch at work, it depended on this homemaker, woman, housewife at home, making it all happen for him. And, you know, that was a really good model until it wasn't. <laughs> and 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 now we've sort of breaking out of that. And beyond the, you know, this happens at work where you've got a person in power, like a boss who has some artificial sense of their power position, becomes more narcissistic, and all of the followers that do whatever they say that are underneath them that become sort of de- dependent on the emotional state of the leader. Uh, and it just creates this dichotomy that I don't think is accurate. Again, I think things were much more egalitarian. Things were much more, I guess you could say, democratic in the past. And sure, we had mechanisms to regulate these things, and we had ups and downs, and it was all in a continuum. But this outright unjustified arrogance. Have you? And I'm sure you've seen this in society where you've just got somebody that you don't understand how they can be so confident to the point of arrogance, thinking nothing can go wrong. They can do no wrong. Nobody is ever going to have an ill thought about them. It's almost as if their entire life has been one experience after the other of people worshiping them or telling them or somehow supporting the idea that they are in fact, different and better. And I think this is a bit of what, like, the the far right has declared a snowflake. You know, you're so different and you're so important from everybody else. But this is like a special kind of that uh, idea where somehow people believe they have a different ability than others. And, you know, I might be guilty of this to a certain degree, but I try not to exploit it. Uh, to the point where it becomes this this hierarchy where some people uh, have some entitled sense of betterness and just th- therefore they become the decision makers and the leaders and then other people that have a little bit of maybe a little more self-awareness and think that, well, I can't be right all the time and uh, kind of a more realistic view. But then they see this person and they go, well, they know they must know more than me. And you know, it, 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 and, it, and that creates well. I, I guess I, they they need to make the decisions because I don't. I'm not as smart as them, or whatever. And then the most extreme um, artifact of that hierarchical, you know, of, of 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 even entertaining the fact that someone should or ought to or can be in a position of power beyond just needing to represent a group in an egalitarian sense, but that somebody has a a different, different ability, you know, that's insane to begin with, but it, it becomes a kind of a slippery slope thing where it gets exaggerated, right? It becomes even more and more and more of a gap. And what I despise, and I mentioned this before, is this idea of hero worship, where now it's not just, well, I'm not as good at making decisions as this person, so I'm going to give some of my power some of my egalitarian capacity to have equal say in this world, I'm going to give some of that to this person. And again, that creates more and more of this hierarchy because now you're giving real power, whether that's voting power or money or recognition or status or popularity or advertisement, you're giving some of what is your kind of birthright power, right? Away, you're giving it to somebody else. And that's where the real problem is. And the most extreme uh, example of that is in a hero worship where you put some people literally on a pedestal and, and, and sort of like, you know, it becomes like this cult guru thing, like people did to Trump, like people did to this guy in Kenya, like people did to Charles Manson, to a lesser degree, like people do to uh, people like Brad Pitt or Kim Kardashian, where you say, oh, they're so much better than me. They deserve all of my attention and power and time and awareness and consciousness and 
You know, you give these things away and that makes you weaker and them stronger. And then all of a sudden, this strange perception of different becomes real. It becomes very real because now all of the like water flowing through the path of least resistance, the resources will flow to the heroes and then they get more status and they get more wealth and they get more um, power and then they get, you know, they get more arrogant and then it, it, it becomes this, <clears throat> this, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy just because you had the initial thought of perhaps I'm not as good as this person. And I think this is all based in fear that I'm not good enough. Uh, I'll make the wrong decision. I don't want to deal with being wrong. I don't want to speak up. I don't want to be seen. I don't want a, a light to be shine on me. I just want to blend into the background. I want to be anonymous. And this fear, like any fear, can quickly turn into an addiction. And I think codependency is basically an addiction. It's an addiction to absolving yourself of fear. You know, it's an addiction of false comfort that you feel in shining the spotlight on somebody else, taking the responsibility away. And I think there's a certain minimum amount of responsibility that every human being is responsible for upon birth. You got to eat your own shit sandwich. You know, you can't, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't mean that, and because that sounds, you know, ecologically unsmart. <laughs> you want to process. You got to deal with your own shit. You have to process it. You can't just give it away for somebody else to do because that creates, um, you know, a debt. Right now, if you're giving your power to some leader because you don't want it, because you don't want to be in the limelight, because you're afraid of making the wrong decision, now you owe them something because they're doing you a favor, and that creates more and more of this unhealthy hierarchy. And I would argue that the narcissistic codependent relationship for the codependent person, it is an addiction. It's an addiction of you take care of me so I don't have to take care of myself. And that can mean a whole lot of different things. And it doesn't necessarily mean literally like with money, although that becomes part of the trap of like the 50s housewife, right? Is, well, if I get divorced... I don't have a job and I don't have any money and I don't have a life. And so it becomes literally a life or death situation. So all of a sudden, your unwillingness to be in the limelight and your unwillingness to make a decision and your fear of making the wrong decision and you're giving your power away to this other person becomes a life or death situation. You're, you're literally trapped. And who got you there in the first place? And again, I say this from experience and probably the, the, the best book or the first book I ever read about this was by an author named Melody Beatty, and it's this Codependent No More series, and it's written mostly, well, for, certainly from the perspective of, and mostly about being associated with an alcoholic, and, and you know, the alcoholic being this kind of literal hopeless addict to this drug and that requires people to, to facilitate that relationship, right? It, you know, you're an alcoholic that can't go to work, that can't raise kids, that can't do all these things. It needs another sober person in their life to sort of take care of all their shit. Uh, And so that's kind of the most obvious and talked about example, but this doesn't, doesn't go for just alcoholism. It can be any relationship. I mean, it's a matter of, it's a power dynamic, right? It's, it's, um, it's people like me who I don't want to, I want to avoid conflict. I want everybody to get along. I want things to be easygoing. If you have are in a relationship with somebody that creates a lot of conflict, you do everything you can to sort of reduce that conflict. And what that ends up becoming is this narcissistic uh, codependent relationship where, well, if this person's willing to do anything to appease me, then I must be better than them. And so it feeds on itself. You know, you can, a codependent can create a narcissist just as the same way a narcissist can create a codependent. And if I haven't said this before, let me say this now. I don't like these absolutes. I don't like these words. I don't think there are narcissists. I don't think there are codependents. I don't like labeling people like that. But there are these gradients of these behaviors, right? Um, If you aren't self-aware enough to consider that maybe you aren't the center of the universe or the most important person or the absolute ruler of your household or better than another person, then you might have some narcissistic tendencies. You need to open yourself up to a little humility. If you don't have humility, you're in a dangerous territory of becoming, of falsely believing that you are some sort of hero. And 
better than anybody else. And similarly, like this is what I suffer from. If you think you're not good enough, if you feel like everyone else um, <clears throat> is better than you, then you're in a situation where you can quickly become a codependent and essentially, you know, not have any feelings, emotions, meaning, value beyond serving uh, other people. And that's, those are both incredibly unhealthy positions to be in. And so this these epi- this episode arc of episode 124, All Leaders are Narcissists, episode 125, Codependency and Other Addictions, it's sort of just pointing out these unhealthy relationships that seem to be very common, at least along some continuum. Everybody seems to, as a result of either the lack of self-awareness or self-awareness and the fear that comes along with the unknown, can get into these relationships. And maybe at some level, it's like self-awareness comes with some 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 issues that you have to acknowledge. And that is, once you become self-aware, it, it opens up the door for the unknown. And that can create fear, and that can create discomfort, and it's easy to search for something to make that go away. And one thing that can go away is the false confidence of heroes, narcissists, and, and powerful leaders that, that are arrogant enough to believe that they're better than you. And so, but those, I'll argue, are false you're worshiping a false god. Self-awareness trumps all of that, but it comes with responsibility. And so I think the next step, maybe this is where the, the importance of this episode, once you become self-aware and once you develop good habits like journaling and meditation that sort of build this, <clears throat> this talent, this capacity to pause and decide and choose how you want to navigate the world instead of just doing it haphazardly according to all the programs, which is what the narcissists and leaders do. They're just implementing the programs that they've been taught. They've just been taught a program that says you're better than everybody else and you can't fail, whereas not everybody's taught that and stumble through life a little bit more. But once either of those types of people or any of the types of people on the continuum in that space become self-aware, then it is about personal responsibility. I I have to show up having done some amount of work to take responsibility for my fear. Yeah, you know, I am afraid but I choose to go forward. You know, it's like bravery, right? It's it, becoming self-aware requires bravery because it'll leave you naked in the crowd of people up front at the front of the classroom unprepared to give a talk or whatever it is, whatever scenario you can imagine that scares you. That's what comes. And then the next step then is not to, and I think people get stuck here, right? Is to be brave and to find whatever it is inside you to, to move ahead. You know, because it's too late. You can't go back. Well, you can. A lot of people will approach the edge of self-awareness and then retreat and stick their head in the sand and, you know, double down on their narcissistic relationships. I see this a lot in marriages and I did it in my own marriage. It's like, I'm afraid to take responsibility for my success or failure at work. And so I'm just going to quit my job and be a stay at home dad and retreat into this safe space where, you know, my wife can do all the earning and I don't have to worry about money and I can just sort of throw up this flag. And, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a that type of fear. And now I realize I've got to sort of own up to that and, 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 and make peace with it and um, be brave as I, as, I, as I move forward in my life as a, and, and not fall back on my addictions to letting other people be responsible for how I feel or you know, what I need. Um, and that pretty much is the gist of it, right? And so you, some level of personal responsibility, you've got to, and, and I don't want to say make yourself happy, But you have to have the self-awareness to understand what you do. Are you, do you have narcissistic tendencies? Do you tend to look at other people as as if they're not as good as you? Well, that's probably wrong. And that's probably something that you need to better understand and do a little investigation. Are you the type of person that gives away your power, doesn't like to make decisions, avoids conflict? All right, well, that's also probably wrong. And again, what's right and wrong, and what and I, I, you know, I did a whole fifty series episode on ours versus should. So I don't want to say that there's some prescribed right way to live your life. I just think that self awareness is, is is a critical element of being human. And then there's a personal responsibility with all right, what have what are the beliefs? 
that I have learned? What has society taught me? What does the, the what did the domestication process and growing up, you know, for and for years and years and years, completely unaware of the programming that the world was sort of teaching you? What of that is do you like? And what of that do you think is not so good? And the basic example of that is. You know, a 35-year-old person uh, sees the Bud Light advertisements with a transgender person and says, the Bible don't say you can do that, and that's bad, and I'm going to boycott Bud Light. All right, well, where did that come from? Did you ever stop to think about what you learned and whether or not you actually agree with it? Aha, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I think if we, the more we parrot the things that we learned as kids that we never had a chance to understand or make a decision about, the more we perpetuate that, the less we're living our lives or living somebody else's life. Uh, and I think, you know, if and as much as I can even come close to doing something like say there's a should or a right way or whatever, I think this self-awareness, personal responsibility, addressing what you've learned, that's, that's, you know, what the philosophers talk about when they say, you know, what, what, a, how, what a good life it looks like, you know, what a, again, I will say the responsibility of being human. Um, and never, obviously everybody can do whatever they want, but I think, um, I think the pathway that leads to comfort, calmness, and something that looks like happiness is paved with personal responsibility, awareness, and introspection. And a big part of this <clears throat> is disassembling uh, what you learned in your life subconsciously or unconsciously. And that's what this path is all about. And I think, you know, looking for landmarks like codependent people, hero worship, gurus, you know, massively unequal power. Uh, differentials and the flip side of that dependence and fear and addiction. Those are like huge tar, you know, luminous targets going me, 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 check, check me out. You know, it's like, it's like sort of the projection thing. You know, when you feel uncomfortable, you're pushing up against the boundary of your comfort zone, literally. Right. I mean, you, I, I like to look at us as having like this luminous, <laughs> egg, like Carlos Castaneda would say, but this sort of sphere around our bodies uh, energetically that we're comfortable in, you know, and every, as long as things are happening inside this, it all feels good and it's normal and that doesn't raise any, 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 any fear. But as we approach the edge of that, as situations in our life happen that push us out of this comfort zone and toward the edge of it, that's where things like fear and chills up the spine and, and questions, they, they come up and you get uncomfortable and the, the, the domestication process teaches us to retreat away from that. But in reality, we can learn to see these as huge flashing indicators of, you know, here's something here that you might want to investigate. Um, and for me, you know, when I got divorced and I started to realize that this codependent narcissistic thing, that these were huge things that made me feel uncomfortable about myself because I don't want to be a doormat. I didn't want to admit that I had given my power away or, or whatever, um, and that made me uncomfortable. But then I realized that 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 this comfort was actually a sign, if you will, or a signal um, of something that I that I could address. And then again, then 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 the end result of that is that our comfort zone expands, and then the universe of possible situations of living in reality become more numerous, right? And then there are fewer things that you can find yourself. You get braver, right? Then it goes back to that bravery thing. And I think it's important to be brave, to understand the fears of moving forward and doing it anyway. That, I mean, maybe that's what happiness is. You know, because what happens there is it steals the opportunity of fear. It's like you're 
you're, you're, as Carlos Castaneda would say, you're dashing past the eagle. You know, there's, there's this, there's this, this guard of your life, guarding you from life, protecting you from hitting life. And, and that guard instills fear in you. And so you don't venture in that direction. And so you minimize the universe of experiences that you can have as a person. And you do the same thing every day. I mean, you know what this looks like, right? You watch Judge Wapner at four and you watch Wheel of Fortune at seven and you have dinner every day at six o'clock. You know, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And who's to say that that's not a perfectly valuable life? That's just not the life that I think myself or anyone watching this or interested about, interested in any of these sort of personal growth or spiritual adventures is interested in. And I think there's really something here that I, and I want to develop later, and let's see if I can paraphrase it a little bit. You know, um, <clears throat> in any non-egalitarian relationships between any people on the universe is an indication of a power differential. And I think the power differential results in two kind of extreme positions that we call narcissism and codependency, and basically it's sort of a, a, um, an inaccurate or undeserved confidence or an inaccurate and undeserved underconfidence. And I think this is a, is, a, is a result of the presence of fear, which is a very normal thing to have for someone who's self-aware, or the complete absence of fear, which is an abnormal thing for people to have. That, that, that And both of these scenarios, these endpoints along a continuum, force you into a ever-narrowing limitation to the capacity or the universe of experiences that you can have as a human and sort of becoming aware of being in either of these positions pushes you more toward the middle, which allows for the greatest potential for expansion of your comfort zone, um, which, which diminishes, which is a result of diminishing your fear, developing bravery and moving forward anyway, which allows you to become a more complete person with more potential to have meaningful experiences in your life, which is how you get towards enlightenment, nirvana, calmness, happiness, whatever it is that you want to feel better. And that brave pathway is uh, the one that results in the least amount of discomfort. So it's not just about pursuing happiness. It's about reducing the suffering that we have every day. Uh, And this... Is, is, is like sort of the, 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 the reason there is Buddhism, <laughs> you know, the reason there is religion, the things that the ancients have, have tried to figure out is how do you do that? And I think maybe that gets at, at sort of the meaning of life, you know, to, to limit the restrictions of your pathway as your life unfolds and you flow into the future as an individual and as a part of the universe, right? Think of it as like water flowing downhill. <clears throat> and our activities in our daily life removes the blockages and the barriers that this water could potentially encounter that will dictate its pathway. And the removal of those barriers and then the reduction of the dictating of the pathway allows that water to flow how it's supposed to flow how it wants to flow. It defines its own path. And isn't that what we all want? And so rather than worship a hero, you know, be the hero. And the way you be the hero is you bravely venture forth. You have a fear and you do it anyway. Anyway. I'm Chris Bircher. This is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. This has been episode 125, Codependency and Other Addictions. And I hope that in some way um, this shines a little light on your own life and your, your own adventure. And I'll see you next week. Take it easy.